Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming out this afternoon, and it's, it's a true delight to be back in Austin. Uh, this is a great city, uh, the city that skipped the recession for the most part, and uh, prospering according to Forbes and everybody else, the fastest growing and, and I would say funnest in, uh, city in the country. So, so thank you to uh, Strauss Center and Bobby and, and Will, the Clement Center. Great to see my friends again here uh, in, in really my favorite city uh, in the country. Uh, I especially like coming because uh, uh, my, my uh, son Gentry is a junior here at UT and my son Marshall is, uh, to, to, to achieve uh, important balance in our family. Graduate of Texas A&M is a, is a <laughs> consultant in, uh, here in Austin and that's so uh, I can I can do both, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, as Bobby said, uh, I just returned from Iraq. This is going to be the most current report of what's going on in Baghdad and Erbil. I, I literally got on the airplane uh, at at 0300 uh, Erbil time uh, yesterday morning, and I got here last night at at midnight. So 30 hours journey. So bear with me. If, uh, if, uh, if, if I lag for a moment, I will, I will, I will be with you. Uh, Bob Strauss, let's start with that, that point. Uh, a, a year of loss and remembrance, but also a year of, of cherishing the legacy of Bob Strauss and the importance that he, uh, the important role he played uh, in, in Washington, in our democracy. We're here to talk about democracy ultimately today. Uh, and and, and at, to UT. And, and um, he, Bob Strauss once said, and this is good for all of us and, and good for the topic today, success in life is, is like wrestling a gorilla. You don't quit when you're tired. You quit when the gorilla's tired. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I'm here to come back from Iraq to tell you that um, the gorilla never got tired over there. Uh, that's, that's one of the challenges that we're facing right now. Uh, in that country that they're facing right now because we contributed 60 plus billion dollars which I oversaw but we also contributed almost 5,000 lives. Blood and treasure expended in the interest of democracy and helping a country recover from the abuse of 25 years of tyranny under Saddam uh, for which they're thankful. Let's, let's begin with that especially in, in Kurdistan and, and occasionally in the South. Uh, but, but the fruits of it are, uh, are still yet to be realized uh, in that country and instead of uh, really realizing those fruits now, we are facing the possibility this year, this is really what I sensed in Iraq, of the country breaking up, of Kurdistan separating, of possibly there being a Shia stan and a Sunni stan to come. And, but I'll get to that in my third part of the talk this morning. I want to begin by giving you an overview of SIGR, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, what I've done for most of the last 10 years. Second, dig into the issue of what, what we're here to talk about, Iraq's biggest lesson. Uh, and then third, uh, give you the very most uh, up-to-date uh, story about what's going on in, in the South and in the North uh, in Iraq. Uh, Sigur was a, was a, a calling that uh, you could never expect. L life is what happens after you finish making plans, right? We're going to talk about planning, uh, right? And that, that's, a, that's an apt uh, quote, uh, both personally, professionally, and, and with regard to Iraq. And, and, and for me, uh, I was called after serving two, a little over two years in the White House uh, with President Bush to, to this one-year assignment, which I finished last year. Uh, it tur turned into nine and a half years because everything else... Uh, including this job that we plan to do expanded into something huge and substantial and engaging over the last years. At, at, uh, Sigur started out uh, with the assignment of overseeing the coalition provisional authorities work. Uh, but, but then uh, as reconstruction grew, uh, so did our mandate. And, and uh, I, I made my first trip to Iraq 10 years ago last uh, month. And, and just returned from, from my first trip to Iraq outside of government, but total of 36 over that span. Uh, and, and in that span also testified on the Hill 36 times before varying committees. So oversight under fire on both sides of the world. Uh, growing experiences and, and uh, amazing uh, opportunities to serve. It truly has is, is, is been the greatest honor of my life to, 
to have to have led this important mission, looking out for your money. I mean, ultimately, it was about stewardship of the taxpayer dollars in Iraq, and and it was about auditing, and it was about carrying this badge around, and insisting on law enforcement, insisting on compliance with with the rule of law, modeling it for the Iraqis. I'll tell you what what do the Iraqis focus on from from my work? They're happy that I. I reviewed the development fund for Iraq. Their money that we spent early on, not terribly well, they're still seeking to recover. But they go, you got a hundred convictions, you know, of your own people? How, how did they allow you to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, welcome to what the rule of law really looks like. It's not that we are corruption free, we're not, but we do something about it. In Iraq, corruption is a cancer, untreated, really, at this moment. And one of the reasons I was back in Iraq was to speak at, the, at a UN conference on corruption. Uh, and and there, there are interests, there's in, there are inclinations, but are there efforts that are meaningful, that are starting to crack down on what has been uh, the theft of, a, of 150 billion through money laundering over the last nine years? And the, the, the answer is no, not, not enough. And, and so that, so that was part of my mission at SIGGERT, to, to build capacity within the Iraqi system, to, to model what good oversight looks like, uh, to, and, and uh, along with looking after your taxpayer dollars. We did 400 audits and inspections. In the course of that, I traveled throughout the country. An amazing uh, experience uh, for me personally. I mean, this is the land of Genesis. You know, I went to Nazareth, uh, also known as uh, Ur of the Chaldees in the Bible and, and visit, walked in Abraham's steps. I went to Mosul, uh, a, a devastated city still in the throes of disastrous terrorism, known as Nineveh, Jonah's city. Amazing. I went to Hilla, uh, where we had a provincial reconstruction team several times, known in the Bible as Babylon. Uh, and indeed, uh, Almost all you need to know about the dysfunction of, of Saddam is to, it can be seen there. The old ruins are there, and on top of it, he was trying to rebuild Babylon. So you have these dusty rocks, bricks underneath. On top of the bright yellow bricks, uh, halfway reconstructed under the delusion that he thought if, if he rebuilt Babylon, he'd become the next ne Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, he didn't know his Bible very well, did he? Look what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Insane in the, in the fields, eating dirt. But... Uh, uh, somewhat how he ended up in Tikrit when we finally caught him. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the reality was that, that that truth was never far from my heart driving me, uh, inspiring me to, to be committed to this country that I've come to love, the people that I, that I came to love over the last 10 years and helping them uh, grow from the, the, the nightmare of Saddam. So we grew ourselves a cigar uh, in Baghdad up to... Uh, uh, 55 personnel, investigators, auditors, inspectors, uh, and, and, um, and, and I think uh, earned respect because of our philosophy. It was not about running a police blotter, although that, it was important to get those convictions. It was not about a list of findings, you know, although keeping people honest through audits is, is, is uh, an essential element to, to civil society. It was about our lessons learned, ultimately. I took all of that material that we gathered and sought to turn it into advisory best practices through nine lessons learned reports. Our last one, Learning from Iraq, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, the key lesson is in it, uh, was, was, was the capstone of, of a series of reports that we derived by going out to the Department of Defense, going out to the Department of State, and, and uh, asking them, you know, here are the challenges. You know, wh what can we learn wh from, from these challenges and how do we build them into, into systems that, that help us succeed? And, and that, I think, was the pathway to our ultimate success in Iraq. You know, we did our job according to what Congress called us to do. But, we, but by engaging with the ambassadors and, and the generals in Baghdad and beyond and here, uh, excuse me, in Washington, uh, we, we were able to, uh, to get buy-in and build relationships and ultimately foster improvements. I mean, the billions of dollars were, were not terribly spent early, well early on. It got better over time, and, 
but, but now to the, to the lesson. The key is how do you capture that? You know, it, we, we, the challenge in carrying out stabilization and reconstruction operations is they are interagency. Now, the, per, perhaps the most significant uh, reform you know, regarding national security uh, the last quarter of the last century was, was something called the Go Water Nichols Act. You know about that. It, it told the military departments, integrate, work together. Out of it came the airland battle doctrine. And out of it came, uh, regardless of what you think of anything else, extraordinary military success in the first and second Gulf Wars. Uh, very rapid, very effective, very integrated. Lessons learned from the, from the early 80s that didn't go so well, for instance, in, in Grenada. Uh, how do we take that Goldwater Nichols ethos and move it into the interagency? Well, that's the, the most important lesson from Iraq. Eisenhower said, uh, it's not the plan that matters, it's the planning. What he meant, what he meant by that is, it, is, is the process of integrated planning, uh, in his case in leading uh, uh, the army, uh, ensured resilience when that plan was gone with the first shot fired. Uh, the, the, old, the old adage that that's the first thing to go when the, when the shooting starts. Uh, we don't have that kind of integrated planning when it comes to stabilization and reconstruction operations today. We haven't learned that lesson from Iraq. Franklin said failing to plan is planning to fail. Well, we've got to find a way to inculcate that evolutionary step within our federal government to ensure that the next time we engage in a stabilization reconstruction operation, we win. So to the biggest lesson, well, let me, before I dig into it, let me give you a couple of runner-up lessons. You know, the, the one runner-up lesson that other, other people say from Iraq is Anyone that wants to engage in a land war in Asia ought to have his head examined, Robert Gates. Uh, a, a fair point, notwithstanding Iraq's not Asia, but, but, the, but, the, but the truth is, is, is we do, his implicit point is before you engage in these kinds of operations abroad, you know, seek every other avenue before you have to, to uh, invest militarily and, and financially and civilly. Uh, the, the other concrete lesson from Iraq, in, 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 of, of the seven from learning from Iraq that, that, are, that, are, that is key, is, is before you engage, be sure you've adequately consulted with the host country's, uh, affected host country's expertise. One of the, I think the biggest challenge during the Coalition Provisional Authority stage was that we pursued a plan that we wanted to pursue. And, th and this is not Stuart Bowen talking, this is this is what the Iraqis told me. There are 44 interviews in, in Learning from Iraq, 17 with senior Iraqis, asking uh, all of the uh, Americans and Iraqis, uh, you know, what, what did you think of how the money was spent and what was the biggest lesson? And the Iraqis to a person just about said to me, the biggest lesson is you didn't talk to us. You didn't engage with us about what we really needed uh, to stand back up from, from the, 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 uh, the devastation and the destruction of Saddam Hussein's uh, tyranny. And, and that's, a, that's a good runner-up lesson, and I'll give you one more runner-up lesson. Don't flood a war zone with cash. You know, why, why, did I, why did I get over 100 convictions and why did, half of them uh, military members? Uh, because because there were, it's, it's impossible to impose effective controls over cash in the, uh, when a civil war breaks out. When, when you have, when you have uh, kinetic conditions uh, de de deteriorate as they did in Iraq in 2005 and 2006, yet we, we were flying those billions of dollars on those C-17s, uh, C-141s out of Andrews, midnight cash flights to Baghdad. Uh, you, you may have read about them, palletized billions of dollars in, in, these, in these cargo holds. Uh, over, over the course of the first nine months of our engagement, um, 11 billion delivered in cash. And then out to wherever, to ministries and to far-flung locations with very limited oversight. Uh, I caught, as I said, 100 or so and convicted them. You know, uh, matter, matter of fact, one, one side uh, anecdote from that, my, my second trip almost exactly 10 years ago uh, uh, this week, I was in Baghdad, and knock on my door, in walks a contractor, says, I'm outraged. A KBR is forcing me to pay bribes. And I said, well, okay, well, you've come to the right place. 
Uh, I'm glad to meet you. What's your name? Philip Bloom. And I said, okay, well, welcome. Have a seat. Well, g give me details. Well, that's when it started to get a little fuzzy. You know, uh, Mr. Bloom was, was not uh, forthcoming. I said, well, you need to go out and get your facts and come back to me. But this was the oldest trick in the book. If you're committing a crime, uh, go to the gumshoe and rat somebody else out, uh, allegedly. Make other allegations. Philip Bloom, uh, eventually we caught him in, in Hilla, in Babylon, uh, and he went to prison. We put him in prison for four years for having stole, uh, stolen eight million in conjunction with, this is part of the cancer that was going on early on, uh, the, the challenges are uh, the, the CPA's comptroller, South Central Region comptroller, uh, he's still in prison. Uh, and, and the, the uh, salt in the wound on that issue is both of them had prior fraud convictions, yet allowed to serve in this setting. And, and, uh, and so this is the kind of thing that can't happen. And the only way we can't happen is if we, if we facilitate a new structure within our government. And that's the biggest lesson from Iraq. Uh, we, we've got to have focused authority, executive authority within the executive branch that is responsible for planning, uh, executing, and overseeing stabilization and reconstruction operations. Uh, and, that, and that means th this, this uh, element would begin to anticipate where those next operations might occur before they occur. We built the airplane in flight in both Iraq and Afghanistan. It didn't fly very well, as such airplanes won't. Uh, and, and so who now in the government is thinking about Yemen uh, or Pakistan or Syria for that matter? Uh, uh, or, or any, you know, there, there is no locus of responsibility for these kinds of operations because they're scattered among five agencies. Right now, it's not that people haven't thought about them, it's just that they, they haven't created a, a, as a primary duty a person, an office, an entity in charge of, of uh, planning for, for the next mission. And we will have the next mission. You know, uh, to a certain extent, the, the, the lesson that's, that's, that's um, tacitly settled in to the, to the collective consciousness uh, within the government is, well, we don't want, we're just never going to do Iraq and Afghanistan again because th they didn't go very well. Well, that's a hope. That's no strategy. Uh, and, and we have been engaged in stabilization and reconstruction operations virtually continuously since 1980. And we will have them again. Uh, and and, the, and the, that's what this lesson digs into and, 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 and serves as an advisory, a warning, a challenge to the government that we've got to do something structurally to prepare for it. You know, if we don't, if we don't prepare, then, then Franklin's adage hits home again. And, we, and, and there's no excuse if it hits home with the kind of pain and difficulty that we experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. 60 billion in Iraq, over 100 billion and counting in Afghanistan, by the way, for, for rebuilding. So right now, you know, what, let's talk about the starting point. You know, what, what do we have within the government now? Right, scattered among the duties and responsibilities for stabilization reconstruction operations are scattered among five agencies. Uh, Department of State has the Conflict and Stabilization Bureau, brand new, recent report out from the State Department IG uh, two weeks ago says not doing so well. Uh, definitely not a thumbs up, mostly a thumbs down. Brick Barton, the head of it, is a friend of mine, and he's doing you know, he's 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 um, doing the best he can within a limited context within the State Department um, bureaucracy. But it looks very much like the Office of Transition Issues, which he founded in in 1994 at USAID. That's the second piece at the unit U.S. Agency for International Development. There is an entity that's in, chiefly focused on rule of law around the world, engaging in projects. Uh, and was heavily involved in, in, uh, in Iraq. But is it, is, is it capable of planning for the next stabilization reconstruction operation? No. So it's not at state, it's not at aid. At DOD, the most significant, uh, I think, evolution in Army doctrine in the last 25 years occurred in 2005 with uh, DOD Directive 3000.05, which uh, Secretary Rumsfeld signed, creating for the Army stabilization operations as, as an essential duty, an essential mission. Uh, and in, so within the field manual now you have offensive ops, defensive ops, and stabilization ops. D 
didn't happen formally until that directive. I mean, obviously, it had been stabilization activity before, but it, but it now was embraced as a primary mission. Uh, how it's been realized is, is gradual. I mean, there's still the, the, the Army is, is, um, is trying to figure out its proper role within these generally civil-led uh, operations, programs, and projects in, the, in their particular setting. Uh, and and the, the reason why it's so difficult is because it's not their primary duty, war fighting is. And second, there isn't an integrated capacity within government to link them to the civil side. So uh, at the, fourth, the fourth entity that, that plays an important role is Treasury. The Office of Technical Assistance there did a good job in Iraq, actually, with, with regard to the currency transfer. Uh, that occurred in 2003 and 2004, and salvaging of the Central Bank of Iraq uh, back in 2003. Uh, but it's very specific, and again, uh, reports up its own chain, not integrated in any way in interagency planning. And fifth, something called ISITAP, which is simply uh, at the Department of Justice, is, is um, uh, a place where, where um, the United States can engage around the world, providing support for rule of law, specifically in courts and prisons and prosecution and judges. And, and they did a lot of work, but in a limited way. Not, never, never a significant deployment from the DOJ uh, in, into Iraq to engage in what is really the cornerstone of any stabilization or reconstruction operation, building the ru a capacity for rule of law, the essential element for a successful democracy, right? As I said earlier, the, it's not that we don't have corruption here, it's that we do something about it within our system. And, and the Iraqis don't. I mean, over $150 billion lost to corruption in, in Iraq from money laundering uh, in the last 10 years, and not much being done about it, frankly. That's, 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 one, that's one of the pieces of news I, I bring back. So what to do? Uh, I'm not just here to report problems, I'm here to provide solutions. That's been one of my mantras at, at SIGGER, and so we have pushed, well, we, we did, it's now past tense, I finished last October, we pushed for reform on Capitol Hill to address this issue, and there were a lot of members on both sides of the aisle and both houses that agreed that a solution had to come forward. And there is a bill in the House now to create something called the U.S. Office for Contingency Operations, which would provide a center of gravity, a locus of responsibility for planning, executing, and overseeing stabilization and reconstruction operations. Is it going to pass? No, not in this Congress. Uh, what will? <laughs> unless, unless, uh, we rename a, unless we rename a post office, USOCO, it won't, it won't happen. Uh, but, but, but the key is, as with all progress, is, is an incremental step in the right direction that begins to educate and elucidate for members the, the, uh, the path that we have to travel so that we're prepared. It's, it's ultimately about offering the president choices. Uh, right? And your choices have to be more than do nothing or improvise when it comes to stabilization and reconstruction operations. You have, you have to be able to offer choices like you now have a capacity that someone's been thinking about to, with regard to country X, Yemen, for example, say, or Pakistan, wherein there's, there's, there's a team that's been doing research on its electrical system, its rule of law system, uh, its, its bank, you know, what, its, its essential uh, uh, security needs. And, and from that, there has been working with contractors, you know, the, an evil word in Baghdad for a, for a while because of, the, because of the difficulty of oversight uh, in, in, in Iraq. Uh, got to have somebody that, that brings contractors to the table. You know, my oversight mission was of agencies, and, but we uncovered challenges with a lot of contractors through that process. But, but the key, I think, really, it, I, I don't really point the finger at the contractors for, for the shortfalls because it was improvisational in so many ways. And, and, and the, the pathway to avoid improvisation in so critical a venue, these, these geopolitical national security challenges, is planning. You know, begin... We, we don't respond to hurricanes on the Gulf Coast uh, improvisationally. And if we did, the populace would be outraged because we can anticipate the kinds of, of devastating things that could occur. And so we work within the government and in the private sector and, and across civil military lines through FEMA to get ready for them. 
and we know where they might happen, and we, and we begin to work with contractors in various parts of the country, and we anticipate what, what could get hit in such a storm, we have that ethos within our government, domestically, in a civil setting, through FEMA. Have we realized it in the international security setting? No, we haven't. Even though this lesson is staring at us from, from, the, from the, the vestiges of our experience in Iraq and the, and the ongoing uh, struggles in Afghanistan, we haven't yet responded. So that has been my passion for, uh, for the last uh, three years of our 10-year mission in Iraq to, to inculcate an understanding about the need for that change. And, and it, at least the understanding is there. And, and there have been evolutions within the agencies and beginning attempts to, to achieve integration within the current structures. But ultimately, to use a military term, uh, unless it's the primary duty, not the additional duty of a particular entity, it's never going to get your, your, your attention. You know, when I was in the Air Force, I, I, was, I was an intel officer, all source intel, worked SIGINT and, and MINT and, and HUMINT, and I was also the safety officer. You know, that was my additional duty. I didn't spend a lot of time uh, thinking about my duties as, uh, as the uh, Tactical Fusion Center safety officer. And I spent 99% of my time thinking about uh, what the Warsaw Pact was doing. And, uh, and so we got to make this a primary duty. For, for an entity, and that's why I think the U.S. Officer Contingency Operations makes sense, because it, it wouldn't be that expensive, it wouldn't be that large, uh, and so let me just cl close this, this second piece with addressing the obvious three questions, uh, I think, to this, to this issue. One is, uh, why, why would we want to create such an entity? Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it simply foster our future engagement in further operations? Uh, and, and, and my answer is no. Well, that's an argument against having an army. You know, we, 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 we prepare for challenges because the world's history tells us that we must prepare for challenges. And, and Santayana says if we fail to prepare for those challenges, well, then uh, we are condemned to repeat them. And, 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 and Iraq and Afghanistan, too painful to not learn from, too painful not to respond to in an effective way. It's rational and structural and, um, and forward-looking. Uh, second, okay, so you create this entity. What's it going to do? Sit around and wait for the next stabilization reconstruction operation? Well, yes, in, in one sense, yes, but it's not going to be that substantial. We don't have that complaint about FEMA. We don't say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll quickly cobble together a core when, uh, when the next chaos uh, hits New Orleans. No. It's a worthy investment, uh, we, and it's the same reason we put $600 billion and counting down uh, at, at DOD uh, to, to, get us, to, to give us the capacity to respond to all forms of, of kinetic challenges around the world. So much investment in, in creating the, the very best military in the history of man, uh, and, and yet very little in phase four, the civ mill piece. We don't, we just choose not to invest in that. Uh, and we've got to, I think that's, that's essential to learn from Iraq and Afghanistan. We've got to say, this is a piece, this is an important piece, a, a conclusory piece, a, <coughs> a, a, a crucial piece to, to the ultimate success of peace in the world, which is what, what, what our, why our military exists and why our stabilization and reconstruction capacity should be bolstered to foster peace in, in the modern world. And, and, and third is, well, why should we create one entity to run this when we already invested so much money uh, in all these other entities that are involved in it? And I'd say, check their report card. You know, uh, it, it, if, if, it had, if it worked, if it, the, well, the inverse of it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it's broke, it's gotta be fixed, right? And, and I think the report card on this uh, points us to repair. Uh, okay, on to the gorilla that hasn't gotten tired yet, uh, Bob Strauss, and, and that's Iraq. What did, I, what did I see the last couple of weeks? And, th and this is probably what you're most interested in hearing because it's not abstract, it's concrete. And, and I spent uh, six days in Baghdad uh, last week and, and just returned from Erbil up in Kurdistan uh, last night. And uh, had a fascinating set of meetings. I met with two deputy prime ministers, Shahristani, the head of energy, and Salah Mutlaq, uh, 
both friends, uh, the, the Sunni, uh, who's in charge of services and uh, almost was assassinated uh, two days after I saw him. I'm glad he, he survived. And, and then met with a number of ministers and, and also uh, had dinner with Ahmed Chalabi, who's a member of parliament and, and, and clearly a potential successor. I mean, he certainly is interested in becoming prime minister. He's on something called the Citizens List, along with Bayan Jabber, who's a member of parliament, former minister of interior and minister of finance, who I had dinner with, and Abdel Adel Mahdi, uh, who is the former vice president of Iraq and, uh, and a potential successor. But let's, let's just talk, talk about the issues. Let me, let me put them in context. I mean, the challenges in Iraq now are political and electoral security. Uh, they're sectarian, <coughs> and there are... They're ethnic and regional. Uh, and so we're, at this moment, there, there is, there's a battle going on in Anbar province. Uh, it's Fallujah is under foreign flag, and the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria is running Fallujah now. Uh, they're in Anbar all over. They are in Ramadi, the capital of Anbar. And we're talking, Fallujah's people don't have 40 minutes from Baghdad. I mean, this is, this is at the back door. And, and indeed, as I left uh, week, two weeks ago tomorrow, uh, for Iraq, headed first time flying into ba Bayop, the Baghdad International Airport, I get a, a, an email on my on my uh, uh, iPhone. It says all Americans prohibited from uh, uh, Bayop on Sunday, the day I arrive. <laughs> I went well. My plans can't be changed, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna see what happens uh, here. And it was okay, but I found out later why. The Daesh, one of the one of the elements of the. Uh, of the terrorists, the, the jihadists uh, in Anbar, pushed right to the edge of Bayab. They were, in, they were in Abu Ghraib on Tuesday. Matter of fact, Abu Ghraib prison was closed yesterday in Iraq because of, because of the Daesh presence. So you have now spilling over from Syria in Anbar, as I said, this, a ho uh, an agglomeration of hostile groups to the, to the regime, to Maliki's regime. And, and it's the Daesh, it's, it's Ba'athist, ex-Ba'athist, Saddam's party. And, and you've got uh, Al-Qaeda as well in that mix, and all uh, really part of what I think is a, it's a, effectively a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran that's going on in Syria and Western Iraq right now. Uh, competing Sunni, the Sunni, uh, uh, in, Sunnis in, in Saudi and Shia from, from Iran. Uh, Iraq is one of two Arab countries that have majority Shia, uh, the other being Bahrain. And Bahrain is still like, like Iraq used to be uh, ruled by minority Sunnis. The, the, the majority Shia are, are subject to the, the monarchy there. Uh, right now, uh, there, as I saw on TV, uh, Prime Minister Maliki is, is, has been running this year, the last three months, uh, on a campaign to, to to prove his power to suppress and fight and push back uh, the, the, uh, the terrorists in the West. Uh, the bad news is for him is it hasn't succeeded very well. That fight is, is at a stalemate. And Iraqi units are, have not been able to get to siege Fallujah back. And, and, that, uh, and there's been a lot of loss of life out there, as I learned in, in, in Baghdad, not reported. We don't, we don't see that in the news. Uh, but it's been, but 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 the conflict has been grave and costly. In Erbil, I, I talked to a number of ministers and and uh, and learned the foreign minister and the minister of planning, the minister of uh, reform within the government, and the and the uh, prime minister senior advisor, and and uh, it it is very very serious right now the the fracture between Erbil and Baghdad. Uh, as, as you might have read, there's, a, there's an oil crisis with regard to Kurdistan. There's a, a million and a half barrels sitting in, in Turkey at the port of Cheyon that, that, that Turkey will not export until it hears from Baghdad. It's maxed out, can't take any more. Uh, Kurdistan is not exporting any more oil thus, uh, but, and, and, and so it has no, has no income, legal income, from, from, from its massive oil resources, but the, the, the crucial uh, component of what of the chaos that's 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 affecting Kurdistan right now is they haven't gotten any money from Baghdad for six months. 
So there, there are federal employees that are, are unpaid. It's a recipe for revolution. And, and they were, they, there, there's been shuttle diplomacy back and forth from Erbil to Baghdad. But what I heard in Kurdistan was if Prime Minister Maliki continues, there, there will be a push for a referendum for independence. Masoud Barzani has said that, said that publicly yesterday, and the day before yesterday. And that, uh, you know, th th that's, that's especially sobering in, in light of the fact that Iraq gets its first two F-16s in September, and then two a month till it has 36. Uh, and whereas the Kurds have no heavy weapons. And, and uh, Kurd Kurdistan and Turkey are very, very close now. They've developed, they've, they've buried all their uh, problems, their, their terrorist problems that they've had. And uh, the, the prospect of Kurdistan seeking separation is very real. And, and then the second element is the prospect of, of the Sunni provinces seeking separation through re the region's law, a, a law that gives us effective quasi-independence to, to, uh, to provinces that can meet the bureaucratic requirements, which they've tried to do and they haven't yet. They're, they're, they're apparently easy to defeat as, in the parliament, uh, uh, is, is real. I mean, so we could have a, Kur uh, a Kurdistan that seeks independence. We could have a Sunni stand that's pursuing independence and a Shia stand in the south. So Joe Biden's prediction of 10 years ago now uh, could, could, be, uh, could, could be, become possible in this year. This is a threshold year in Iraq. So much of what we invested, uh, blood and treasure, uh, diplomatic effort, military effort, uh, civil reconstruction, oversight effort. I mean, it's a painful mission for me in that um, almost exactly six years ago, I lost an auditor to a rocket in the, in the green zone and it killed direct hit on his trailer. And I had five others wounded. Uh, all of which were very, very serious, and they're all okay now. But, but, uh, but, uh, but oversight under fire was what it was. It was, it was, it was a sacrifice that that everyone who worked in Iraq and in Baghdad and beyond bore, uh, civilian or military. And I point that out simply to underscore the commitment and sacrifice that that this country made uh, to to get Iraq to this point. Uh, to get this tireless guerrilla, you know, to its to its uh, an election year. So, so let me. I realize I've been painting a very negative uh, tone because these are challenges. But let me let me give a silver lining on this. There is an election in Iraq. There isn't an election like this in any other Middle East country. An election that offers the the possibility for change in power, for regime change by vote, not pistol. Uh, and, 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 uh, and there are some promising signs within the, you know, uh, within the, that, that system that, that uh, Iraq could evolve out of its very difficult moment. Uh, but, but it's dealing with, I'll just close with this point that, in my view, you know, the, the consequences of the collision of four arcs of history that, that we experienced in 2003. You know, the, the millennial old arc of Persian Arab uh, conflict, you know, Iraq, Iraq's land being a battleground for that uh, over the millennia, and, and certainly now one, as, as I said, in the form of a proxy war in the West between Saudi and Iran. Uh, to Sunni Shia, 1400-year-old arc. And this, this stems, as, as, as most of you know, from, from just an argument about the, who, who should have succeeded Muhammad. Uh, and, and, uh, and the Shia believed it should have been Ali, who came, who came four later, or but, and the Sunnis believed that it, appropriately it was Abu Bakr and Uthman, then Omar. Then Ali came on and he was uh, killed, and then uh, his sons Hussein and Hassan were killed as well, and 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 it is that um, that 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 slice of history that drives this Shia Sunni uh, conflict today uh, in 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 a, 
in Iraq, but not just in Iraq, in, in, in Syria and, and elsewhere, and, 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 and Lebanon, for that matter. Lebanon's had a tough year as well. Lebanon is about 50-50. Uh, or the, the, is the, the Muslims in Lebanon are 50 percent Shia and Sunni. Uh, and then the, um, s the third arc is that of colonialism. And, and that, that's the British legacy and really the, the, uh, the, the, their 14 year struggle to bring stability to Iraq after World War I and the frustration of, uh, in leaving and appointing King Faisal as Sunni to lead the country, setting the stage for for the, 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 the uh, a disjunct between, with the minority ru ruling the majority uh, in the face of that Sunni Shia uh, history. And the fourth is totalitarian arc, uh, Saddam's 25 year abuse of the country uh, for his own deluded, insane uh, purposes. Uh, and, and, and that, of course, it was, it, was a, it was a 25 years of war. He immediately invaded Iran. Uh, over uh, dubious uh, land claims and really oil-related issues and that you, that you all know more about than I, uh, and then uh, spent eight years s slaughtering in a, in a slaughter with, that, with really no effective result, uh, and then followed that with seizing Kuwait that led to the first Gulf War and then really an ongoing low-intensity conflict, you know, with the no-fly zone. That was that, that dominated the 90s, and then and then uh, and then 2003. Uh, it's impossible, as I've learned in my many visits to Iraq and my from my many Iraqi friends, to to grasp how dysfunctional the country became under Saddam's police totalitarian state. Uh, it, it it became a, a net importer of food, uh, reliance on the food basket. It, it became a really a, a corruption became the common culture. So I'll just close with that, that last point is that, that, that corruption is a cancer that has inflicted the South and, and it's also the North in a different way. Uh, the difference being in the North, the, the, the Kurds generally keep the money in and spend it. As I saw in our bill, you know, the, the cranes everywhere, buildings going up everywhere. It's, it's a completely different uh, sense than you get in, in Baghdad. Uh, in the South, so much billions, 150 billion p potentially lost uh, to money laundering that's gone to uh, Dubai and banks in Dubai and, and uh, Beirut and Amman and then off to who knows where. Uh, the, so the, 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 this year, this threshold year has to bring uh, whatever the outcome of the election uh, and, and by the way, April 30th is the date of the election. That's just the beginning. Uh, it'll be six months before we know the result because the bare knuckle brawl begins to, to get to 168 seats in Parliament, which is how many the, the, you have to see, get to become prime minister. Uh, we, 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 we will have to see if however, whoever gets to 168 is ready to take seriously a reform agenda in the face of, frankly, uh, uh, a painful and difficult 10 years that's, that the country has seen since 2003. You know, I, I want to I underscore again, however, that that opportunity is here because of the electoral process that exists there. And, and, uh, and they have a constitution that we hope they learn to begin to observe and abide by and not amend uh, on an interim basis through opinions. Uh, but we'll have to see. And, and, uh, and, and I'll be going back again and, uh, because I love the country and I love the people and, and I'm going to continue to seek in, from my private sector position uh, pathways to provide um, help uh, as, as, as the country moves forward and, uh, and, and um, of course regularly praying for it. So th thank you all uh, for your attention and I think we've got some time for, for questions, for Q&A and uh, and I appreciate your patience in, uh, in hearing me drone on after uh, 30 hours of uh, journeying uh, from the other side of the world uh, to get back to the best city in the United States. So thanks.